The date is April 27, 1865, and the night is dark save for the hundreds of stars above you. You relax in your cabin aboard the steam paddle boat Sultana, hearing the steady thumping of the paddles on either side of the ship as they propel the boat along, along with the conversations and soft singing from almost 2,000 Union soldiers aboard. You chuckle to yourself, thinking how 50 years in the future a bunch of poor souls will be aboard an Atlantic passenger liner playing a losing game of chicken with an iceberg. You're safely aboard a paddle boat on the Mississippi River. No icebergs here. Then, suddenly, there's an explosion, followed by screaming. The entire ship shakes and shudders, and not long after, there's a second and then a third explosion. Your paddle boat is sinking fast, and it's 1865, so you remember that you don't know how to swim. The Sultana stands as the US's worst maritime disaster, and one of the worst maritime disasters in the world. The sinking of this paddle boat would ultimately kill more people than even the Titanic. And yet, most people today have completely forgotten about the event. Even when it happened though, the tragedy of nearly 2,000 dead was largely ignored, though that may be due to a public having grown indifferent to death after years of civil war. What can't be ignored, however, is that the deaths of 1,547 men could have all been prevented if it wasn't for some good old-fashioned government corruption and the greed of the Sultana's captain. At the end of the Civil War, both sides got around to the business of reconstruction. The North was looking forward to returning troops coming home, and the South was busy fixing its shattered economy. Both sides had released tens of thousands of enemy prisoners, and in camps near Selma, Alabama and Andersonville, Georgia, Union prisoners had been marched to a camp outside of Vicksburg, Mississippi, so they could get passage back up north on a ship. Plying that river was Captain James Cass Mason, in command of the Paddle Wheeler Sultana, with a tonnage of 1,719 tons, a length of 260 feet, and a beam of 42 feet. The Sultana was a small steam liner that typically carried bales of cotton. During the war, however, she and her crew of 85 had been commissioned to carry troops instead. And when Captain Mason stopped in Vicksburg for repairs, he heard about the troops needing passage up north. The US government had offered a fee for $5 of each soldier and $10 for each officer to be transported north, which was somewhere on the order of around $150 for each soldier alone in today's money. Needless to say, this was an incredible opportunity to make a great deal of money very quickly, and Captain Mason was never one to let an opportunity pass him up. Yet, a hired mechanic argued with Mason and his chief engineer over the plan to transport soldiers, highlighting that one of the Sultana's four boilers needed very serious and very urgent repairs. Mason shooed his engineer off, however, and ordered him to do a patch-up job. If he waited for proper repairs, then all those soldiers would find another way to get home. Steamships had in recent decades replaced sail ships all across the world, yet steam technology was notoriously dangerous. On a steamboat, the ship is powered by the heating of water until it produces, you guessed it, steam. That steam is then fed to a piston cylinder and the incredible pressure pushes the piston up. When that piston is pushed up, it opens a valve that lets the highly pressurized steam vent out safely and thus drops the piston, starting the entire cycle over again. Problems occur when that valve isn't fully opened and the steam isn't able to vent quickly enough. Then pressure rises rapidly until inevitably there's a steam explosion. Other times though, a ship that takes on too much water could have very cold water come into contact with the superheated boilers and cause an explosion that way. In the Sultana's case, it appears that she suffered both fates. But before she did, the hired mechanic once more protested to Captain Mason about the necessary repairs. He was ignored and for a second time ordered to carry out a patch repair job, something good enough to get a ship full of yanks up home and then the boilers could get the proper repair they needed while Mason went swimming through piles of cash, Scrooge McDuck style. Mason quickly got in contact with a government official and offered his services. The Sultana was only rated to carry 376 passengers, and yet over 2,000 Union soldiers needed to be transported. Seeing it as an investment in his soon-to-be-rich future, Captain Mason bribed the government official to let him transport as many soldiers as he could fit on the ship. And seeing no harm in overloading a boat by a factor of six, the official happily accepted the bribe, and soon the Sultana was setting off with over 2,100 people on board. The ship was so cramped that there was barely any room for anyone to sit down, and soldiers had to lay where they could, many of them crowding the decks. The decks themselves creaked and sagged, needing to be supported with the use of heavy wooden beams. 
On April 24, 1865, the Sultana set off from Vicksburg carrying 1,960 former prisoners of war, 22 guards from the 58th Ohio Volunteer Infantry, 70 paying cabin passengers, and 85 crew. The prisoners had just spent months or even years in Confederate prison camps, and many of them were in bad shape. Injuries and illness plagued the soldiers, and yet they were all looking forward to getting back home to loved ones. Sadly, Captain Mason's greed would make that an impossibility. On the day the Sultana set off, the Mississippi River was particularly dangerous to navigate. The river was flooding in many parts due to dammed Yankee snow from up north melting in springtime and feeding torrents of water into the river. The flooding had uprooted trees, and on that fateful day, they choked the water as far as the eye could see. Fast-moving river water only compounded the dangers, yet the Sultana was safe enough as she picked her way up north. Over the next two days, she made her way along the flooded Mississippi, the flooding so extensive that it spread as much as three to five miles inland, and left only the tops of tall trees visible. On April 26, she reached Helena, Arkansas, and photographer Thomas W. Banks took a famous photo showing her overcrowded decks. Around 7 p.m., the Sultana finally reached Memphis, Tennessee, and here she unloaded 120 tons of sugar from her cargo hold along with about 200 men. These men would no doubt be counting their lucky blessings just a few hours after their debarkation, but for now the Sultana steamed up river to take on a new load of coal. That night, just shy of 2 a.m., the Sultana was slowly steaming up north of Memphis. The boilers were being overworked, and the allowable steam pressure in each had been exceeded as the heavy ship tried to fight against the river's current. To make matters worse, the boilers were made out of a type of metal that was known to crack and become brittle when heated and cooled repeatedly. Given the nature of a steam engine, this should have probably tipped off its constructors and warned them against its use. Suddenly, one of the four boilers exploded. The soldiers had been packed in so tight that many were right up against the boiler room itself, and the blast instantly killed hundreds. A moment later, shrapnel from the first explosion pierced the other boilers and two of them blew up as well. The massive explosion was followed by a huge release of superheated steam, literally cooking hundreds of men alive. With the force of the explosion directed upward at a 45 degree angle, the decks above were ripped apart, along with the men trying to sleep on any open spot they could find on the cold wooden floors. The pilot house was itself ripped apart, instantly killing the boat's pilot and its believed Captain Mason. The force of the explosion had killed hundreds, but some lucky few were merely pitched into the cold dark river. This would save them from the collapsing smokestacks with one plunging into the hole torn open by the explosion and the other falling forward and crushing dozens of men to death as it fell on the crowded forward deck. The forward half of the upper decks collapsed from the structural damage and the weight from the smokestack, sending hundreds plummeting down into the furnace boxes. The open fire boxes quickly set fire to the ship, turning the steamship into a raging inferno in minutes. Those who survived the initial explosion, the collapsing decks, the fire, and the crushing smokestacks all panicked and tried to jump into the water to save themselves. Due to many not knowing how to swim, however, and the fact that most of the men were weakened by their time in captivity, most drowned. Men desperately clung on to each other but succeeded only in ensuring that entire groups drowned together. Along the shore, Southerner and former Confederate soldiers rushed to boats and other steamships in a bid to try and rescue as many survivors as possible. Where just weeks ago the two sides would have been trying to kill each other, now a desperate attempt to save the drowning Union soldiers was launched. Sadly, the fast river current, the raging inferno aboard the ship, and the weakened condition of the men doomed most to death. An exact death toll is unknown, but the best estimated comes from the United States Customs Service, which listed the official death toll at 1,547. Bodies from the wreck continued to wash up months after the incident, though, and Captain Mason's own body, or that of his chief engineer, were never found. Roughly 760 survivors were rushed to hospitals in and around Memphis, and in a stroke of luck, the Union had turned Memphis into a supply and recuperation city during the war. Here, the Union's wounded could be treated and they could recuperate from their injuries rather than being shipped all the way up north. This turned out to be a bit of good luck for the survivors as there were plenty of medical facilities available to treat the wounded. Of those that made it to hospitals, only 31 died as a result of their injuries. Surprisingly, despite the war having ended just weeks ago, the people of Memphis showed great sympathy for the Union victims. In the wake of the Sultana's accident, conspiracy theories have abounded. Some claimed that Confederate sympathizers had sabotaged the ship in order to kill as many damned Yankees as they could, embittered by their loss in the war. 
Yet an investigation into the incident revealed that the cause of the disaster came down to a combination of factors, chief of which was Captain Mason's greed. Secondary was the weak metal used in the construction of her boilers and the pre-existing damage which turned them into a ticking time bomb. In the end, though the Sultana killed more than the Titanic, she remains relatively obscure and perhaps that's because her sinking was preceded just two weeks earlier and overshadowed by the assassination of President Lincoln. Do you think the sinking could have been averted? Was it really a plot by Confederate sympathizers? Let us know in the comments and as always if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more great content.